In the last video where I introduced how to generally use Docker, I said stuff like, we can use Docker exec to execute a process within this container, or inside of this container we are root. And at the end of the video, I told you to rewatch the video and replace container with namespace. So you would get, we can use Docker exec to execute a process within this namespace, or inside of this namespace we are root. So what are namespaces? We will answer this in this video and we will also understand why containers are not like VMs. Like always, when you want to learn how stuff works, it's a good idea to just check the documentation or source code. In this case, let's start with the Docker documentation so we can work our way down. The underlying technology. Docker is written in Go and takes advantage of several features of the Linux kernel to deliver its functionality. Docker uses a technology called namespaces to provide the isolated workspace called the container. When you run a container, Docker creates a set of namespaces for that container. These namespaces provide a layer of isolation. Docker engine uses namespaces such as the following on Linux. The pit namespace for process isolation, the net namespace to manage network interfaces, or the mount namespace to manage file system mount points. There are a few other features used as well, but the core functionality to achieve this concept of containers are the namespaces. Before we look at namespaces, let's make a few different observations first. So this here is a shell inside the container, and this is outside the container on the host. In the container, I'm the user CTF, which has the user ID 1000, and on the host, I'm the user named user, and have the user ID 1000 as well. When I create a file in the container, I see that it's owned by the CTF user. And when I look at the shared folder on the host, I see that it's owned by me, the user. That's kind of interesting, right? Same user ID, different names. But look at this. So I'm executing watch with PSAX. Watch is a small tool to watch the output of a command every two seconds. In this case, always execute PSAX to look at the list of running processes. So you can see here the watch process itself, and you can also see ynetd, because this is the challenge container from the previous video. Now let's look at the processes on the Linux host. There are a lot more processes, a lot, but if you look very closely, you can find a mysterious watch PSAX process. What? It has the PID 12,675, but inside the container, it has the PID 7.9. This should be your first evidence that the Docker containers are not VMs. They share stuff with the host system. There's a certain level of isolation between the host and the container. I mean, inside the container, you can't see the host processes, but clearly it's not like an actual VM. Now let's use PS tree to look at the tree of processes. You can see here system D is the init process one. That's where the system started. And system D then started different services. Just FYI, if you ever wondered, that's how Linux works. There's an init process which uses syscalls to clone and fork itself and then execute new child processes. Eventually, one of those child processes will be a shell you use. Anyway, we are looking for our watch process from inside the container. Where is it? Ah, there. So it's a child from the container D shim process, which is a child from container D. And container D is a service started by system D. What is container D? an industry standard container runtime. It manages the complete container lifecycle of its host system, whatever that means. In the readme of the container D repository, we can also read this. Runtime requirements for container D are very minimal. Most interactions with the Linux container features are handled via run C. So let's check out run C. Run C is a CLI tool for spawning and running containers according to the OCI specification. Okay, so we have like Docker, Container D, Run C, oof, what is all that? Let's zoom out again and look at the high level Docker overview. There's this picture of the Docker architecture. The Docker command line tool that we use, like Docker build or Docker run, is a client that communicates with the Docker daemon, Docker D. The D at the end always refers to daemon, which is a term for like background running services. The Docker client can talk to the Docker daemon via an HTTP REST API or Unix socket. Now in the Docker D documentation, you can search for container D and find this sentence. By default, the Docker daemon automatically starts container D. Combining with what we learned before, we can paint this picture. 
Docker communicates with the Docker daemon, Docker D. Docker D started Container D earlier because Container D actually manages containers, but it uses Run C, which is used for actually spawning and running containers. So let's investigate. We could use strace to attach to the current Containerd process to trace all the syscalls Containerd uses. We also want to specify minus f to follow all child processes and log the output to a file. Pid of Containerd gives us the process ID so we can attach to it. This way we should figure out how containers work. All right, we are attached. Now let's use docker run to start a new container and this immediately triggered Containerd to spawn some new processes and doing stuff. The container runs now, so we can have a look at the syscall trace. This trace is huge and most of it is not necessary, but for example, we know that Containerd should run run C to actually start the container. So let's look for that. Here it executes Containerd shim, we saw that as another child process of Containerd earlier, and we know it must also be the parent of the container processes. Let's continue. There we go. The next call to execv is to execute the run C binary. Now I'm looking for a very specific syscall, but there are so many. It's obviously doing a lot of stuff. Let's see if I can find it. I scrolled for quite a while and was unsure if I would miss it. I mean, I know what I'm looking for and could search for it, but I was curious if I can catch it. Ah, there it is. Unshare. That's the magical syscall I was looking for. And just before you can see that in the same process, so that number here is always the process ID where the syscall was called, before it called process control with set name, which sets the name of the calling thread. So this is the child thread of run C, which calls unshare. So what is unshare? Unshare allows a process to disassociate parts of its execution context that are currently being shared with other processes. The argument specifies which parts of the execution context should be unshared. All flags here are interesting, but let's focus on one of the flags, clone new PID. It means unshare the process ID namespace so that the calling process has a new PID namespace for its children, which is not shared with any previously existing process. Namespaces. The calling process is not moved into the new namespace. The first child created by the calling process will have the process ID 1 and will assume the role of init in the new namespace. So let's follow this process and we can find a clone syscall. This creates a new child process. So this will become the PID 1, the init process of the new namespace. The return value of clone is the new process ID on the host because it was called from the host, but inside that namespace, it should have process ID one. When we look at what this process is now doing, we can see that it still runs C, but it renames itself as init. It has become the init process of this namespace, of this container. And now let's continue to see what this new child process does. Eventually it calls clone again and creates another child process. But this time it's a process in the new pit namespace, right? When process ID one has a child, it should have PID two. And clone, as I said, returns the new PID. So what does clone executed in that PID namespace return? It returned two. Now strace is a bit confusing because obviously outside the namespace where strace is running, this child process will have a different PID. It might be this one here, 29866. But the return value of that syscall inside that namespace is two. The processes inside of that namespace think the process has now PID 2. You have now these two parallel universes. They are somewhat shared. The processes of this child namespace live in the parent universe 2, but that PID namespace creates a bubble around all the children and they think they are PID 1 and 2. So this is the process ID namespace. There are many more namespaces and in the main page of the unshared syscall you can see which exist clone new ns, unshare the mount namespace, mount namespaces provide isolation of the list of mount points seen by the processes in each namespace instance. Every storage is mounted, so this refers to stuff like your hard drive, swap, the temp file system or procfs. You might want containers to be isolated from your host file system. Or clone new net, unshare the network namespace. So you can also isolate the containers from the networks that are available on the actual host. That's it. That's the magic behind containers. Docker is just a fancy interface around this unshared namespace feature. 
containerd and runz are just components to interface with all that. And in the end, it comes down to these syscalls that tell the kernel, please fake a new process ID or fake a new network for this child process. Now, one last thing. You can check the namespaces of a process in the proc file system. So here we have the PID of the watch process, which we know must run in its isolated namespace. And with ls, we can check the ns folder for this process. And now we can see here the different namespaces identified by this number. Let's compare this to the init of my host system. So this is not inside the container. This is actual system D on my machine. And we can also look at the namespace of the current shell process. Dollar dollar just represents the current process ID. And if you look closely and compare, you can see that my shell and init, which run on the host, share the same namespace. They see each other normally. But the watch process inside of the container has a unique namespace. But not everything. It has a different PID namespace. We knew that already. But the user namespace is the same. This makes sense, because in the unshare syscall, we didn't see the flag clone new user. But user namespaces are cool. A process's user and group IDs can be different inside and outside a user namespace. In particular, a process can have a normal, unprivileged user ID outside on the host, while at the same time having a user ID of zero inside the namespace. So you could be a root inside of a container, but in reality, you are just a regular user. It looks like you are user ID zero root, but you actually have no additional privileges. But for the example at the beginning, this was not the case. Use IDs were equally mapped inside and outside the container, and you saw that when we created that file. The user ID was 1000 inside and outside the container. We just had different names displayed for it because the name is read from etc pass wd. Inside the container, the name was ctf, and outside it was user. Anyway, I hope this helped you better understand what containers are and you understood that you are using the same kernel inside and outside the container and that you can choose what to unshare and not unshare between the host and the container. And that's why it's not like a VM and you need to be careful that you don't expose too much to the container because it can be dangerous for breaking out of it. And of course, some kind of kernel exploit would mean you can break out of it too. I can also recommend to you the LWN article about namespaces. It's from 2013 and many things have evolved, but it's still a good introduction for namespaces. At least it was my first resource where I learned about it.